titled Commercial Catalytic Tracking Before Food Review. particularly happy there, partially being in Texas, he wanted to go back to Texas. His bride-to-be was a, a master's candidate at Bryn Mawr, and uh, she wanted to go back to Texas after she finished her degree. And he wanted to learn more about the petroleum industry and petroleum refining. So he petitioned the company every chance he got to be moved to back to Texas, where the headquarters of the company was and where much of the research was done. Eventually, they were 
planted and sent him back to Texas, where he went to the Port Arthur Refinery, which was the first and the major refinery at the time for the Texas company. On his way, he stopped in Houston, where he met the person who would be his supervisor while he was at the Texas company, George W. Bray, which was the Bray of the Bray process. George W. Bray had had already a long history in the petroleum industry. He had uh, gotten his chemistry degree at Johns Hopkins and went to work at Indiana Standard's Whiting Refinery uh, under Burton of the Thermal Burton Process fame. He left when Humphreys, who's also a famous name in the Burton Process and the Thermal Practice Process, had came, went to the Sunflower Oil Company and then subsequently to the Texas Company, where when McAfee got there, he was chairman of what they called the Refining Committee at the company, which was the committee responsible for research and laboratory operations at the facility. Now, they, Bray and McAfee had a long conversation when McAfee came in, and they talked for quite some time about what the, was referred to in that day as the gasoline problem. At the turn of the century, when gasoline, which was the natural gasoline you find in crude oil, was distilled out, it would be collected, at least in Texas, it would be collected until spring when the floods came along and then they dumped it in the local rivers because it had virtually no commercial value. But by the early part of the century, in 1907, the Texas company became the first petroleum refiner in the United States to sell more gasoline than Harrison. By 1911, gasoline demand was greater than Harrison demand nationwide. As a matter of fact, between the years of 1910 and 1913, because of the demand, gasoline prices went from, on average, 10 cents a gallon to 30 cents a gallon, which 30 cents a gallon seems pretty good to us today, but if in the next three years our gasoline prices tripled, we'd all have something to say about it. So the gasoline problem was how to get more gasoline out of crude petroleum. At that time, there were no cracking processes took the petroleum, you distilled out the natural gasoline that was there, and then the rest you tried to find use for kerosene, heating oil, asphalt, waste, in many cases. And in particular, Texas and uh, Southwestern Petroleum had low gasoline fractions, natural gasoline fractions. So it was a big problem for young companies like the Texas company and Gulf. Well, McAfee went to Port Arthur Refinery and started doing research, and he developed the slides. Like he developed a process where he was he had been charged by Gray to develop a process on hydrogenation, but he did some other work where he developed a process using aluminum chloride as a cracking agent. He let Gray know in the in December of 1912 of his partial success, and then in January of 1913 told Gray that he had had very good success and worked out much of the problems in cracking crude petroleum or petroleum distillate fractions to increase the yield of gasoline. Gray then filed what is the drawing on the right, although it's very difficult to see in the slide, filed two patents on aluminum chloride based cracking. Um, McAfee was very upset by the fact that his name appeared nowhere on those patents. So he went to Gray, got no satisfaction, went to Holmes, who was the vice president in charge of uh, research at the Texas company. He is the Holmes of Holmes Manley, which is a very important thermal process that was developed by uh, Texaco in the late teens and early twenties. And Holmes would not side with him either. He sided with Gray and, and told McAfee that the patent was Gray's. McAfee, being very unhappy, went across the street. Uh, Port Arthur was, and to a large extent still is, a two-company town. The Texas company, now Texaco, on one side, and on the other side, Gulf, which now would be Chevron. The, uh, he went to Gulf where he met George H. Tabor, was to be a very important person in his development as an engineering chemist. Tabor was very interested in this aluminum chloride process because, like Texaco Gulf, wanted to solve the gasoline problem. What the, he, he spoke to the company's lawyers, and at that time, the way the law was interpreted, because
because McAfee had been told to develop a hydrogenation process, and the aluminum chloride process was not a hydrogenation process, then the lawyers said that McAfee should have the rights to the patent. And if he left Texaco and came to Gulf, the rights would move with him to Gulf, which is exactly what McAfee did. Uh, the Gulf oil tour, or Gulf refining at that time, they promised him that they would make him head of aluminum chloride refining and provide him with the resources to develop an aluminum chloride based refining process. And so the drawing on the left is actually part of his patent. These drawings, you can see them better, are very close to one another. As a matter of fact, in the 20s, one of the writers in one of the chemical technology texts that I was looking at expressed some surprise that either of these processes were ever awarded patents because there was significant literature precedent, and actually there were also patents, precedenting use of aluminum chloride in terms of the petrochemical industry. If we look here, we find that Back in 1877 in Britain, on behalf of Friedel and Crafts, the first aluminum chloride-based cracking um, application was patented. The subsequent pat patents that are there in the late 1800s, early 1900s, are for the most part for processes in which you would do polymerization rather than breaking the material, high boiling material down to crack it. But polymerization using aluminum chloride becomes very important later on in this story. So. There's also a fair amount of aluminum chloride process literature, beginning with Friedel and Kraft's uh, discussion of cracking the petroleum in 1878, and a number of other processes, most of which are producing lubricating oils by polymerization processes, although there's a couple of uh, cracking type processes indicated. These are all prior to 1912, when um, McAfee started doing his research. The significant difference in what McAfee did, to be fair, and if you want to count Gray in, what Gray did, was they made improvements and changes in the actual process. They did not claim to have invented using aluminum chloride. They affected a process that made it commercially feasible. Many other people, in 1915, when Gulf Oil Corporation and McAfee announced at a AICAG meeting that they had a process for cracking using uh, aluminum chloride. They were not the only people who were trying to develop a process. Um, obviously, Texas Company had started in 1913, but a number of other refiners spent a significant amount of money trying to develop aluminum chloride processes. And these are some of those who have patents be, um, before 1929 when the aluminum chloride cracking uh, ended at Gulf Oil Corporation. Uh, a couple of, one in particular that we should note is the Hoover Company, which has patents in 1922. There is some evidence that the Hoover Company did commercialize aluminum chloride cracking, although I have not been able as yet to find anything about the Hoover Company other than a notation in National Petroleum News that they had utilized their patents and developed a commercial process. I do have both the patents that they applied to them. Um, Standard Oil was very into this kind of thing, uh, as was Universal Oil Products. They eventually ended up getting into a joint licensing agreement with uh, Texaco, where they shared all their knowledge on the chloride crack. <clears throat> Once the, the Gulf Oil Corporation had the patent, they filed their patents, Texas company filed um, infringements against the patents, it went through the entire patent process and going all the way up to the commissioner of patents and then went into the court system. From 1915 to 1928, Texaco and Gulf sued one another repeatedly, um, had appeals, had all kinds of infringement suits against one another on aluminum chloride based practice. During that time, Gulf was the only one who actually really tried to commercialize this process, but suits went back and forth. were finally settled in 1928 in favor of Gulf and McAfee. During that time, the two companies together uh, managed to obtain over 50 patents on aluminum chloride and aluminum chloride cracking type processes. 
these, this picture here is of some of the thousand barrel stills that were built by the Gulf Oil Corporation. These, this picture would date from the mid to late 20s. In 1915, they built their first of these stills, these thousand barrel stills, and what they uh, found was their biggest problem was aluminum chloride, not the cracking. They got the cracking worked out, but aluminum chloride was very expensive at that time. In 1913, when McAfee began his work, he paid $1.50 a pound for aluminum chloride. Now, he, what he found was that he could make about a gallon of gasoline for every pound to pound and a quarter of aluminum chloride, depending on his charging stock. But 30 cents a gallon, if you can figure, that the math doesn't quite work out for this process. So what ended up happening was Tabor, the general manager of the refinery in Port Alford, who eventually became vice president of uh, Gulf, uh, agreed to allow McAfee to spend as much money as he needed to develop a process for making aluminum chloride on a large scale. Um, this is another shot of the stills from the side. Um, the, uh, Jerry McAfee, who's Albert McAfee's son, who uh, joined Gulf Oil Corporation and rose to the level of chairman of the board of the company before retiring, in his uh, Chemical Heritage Foundation oral history interview, uh, has some comments about the process by which they were making um, the uh, petroleum. And he comments on how they would have these thousand barrel stills with fires under them couple of days, and at that point there was enough coke in the still that they would drain the stills, and then they would send in workers who would hand shovel out the coke out of the doors in the bottom of the stills in order to clean them out, and then they charge them up again in the, in the process. Uh, his, his comments are, are really very interesting about the real world of doing this kind of thing. Um, to solve the problem of aluminum chloride, Gulf eventually ended up spending a million dollars over three years. And we're talking about the years 1915 to 1918, when a million dollars was a lot of money in comparison to today. They built, at that time, well, in the early 20s, they ended up building the largest electrolytic chlorine manufacturing facility in the United States in order to make chlorine for the sole purpose of making aluminum chloride for the process of, of making their gasoline. Now, this is the view of the chlorine plant and the cell room for the chlorine manufacturer. There were some problems associated. It took them three years to develop the process because there were a number of problems associated with developing commercial chloride. Uh, one of those was how do you make and collect a material that sublimes very easily? Well, they started out by using brick condensers like these. Now these things were like 26 feet long and um, I think six feet on one side, three feet on the other side, and they would mix bauxite and carbon and coke essentially, and they would pass the chlorine through this mixture, heated, so that the the uh, aluminum chloride would rise up and the problem would be it would condense in these these brick condensers, and it would clog the condensers up, and eventually, if you didn't clean them out quickly enough, the condensers would explode. And um, McAfee makes some comments about um, how humorous it was, all these explosions they had, although the workers did not find them to be as humorous as he did. Eventually, they developed another process by which they condensed into a 16-inch in diameter iron pipe with scrapers on the sides that would just knock the aluminum chloride down into a bin uh, to solve that problem. They, the three years of development, one of the reasons they had to go through three years of development was when you have chlorine gas heated to about 400 degrees Fahrenheit, it's a pretty reactive substance and has a tendency to eat through brick pretty quickly. And so it took them three years to develop a way to keep chlorine from eating the apparatus to develop the the process they eventually developed um, involved using a uh, still the fire brick, but they had inside the fire brick bauxite packed uh, on the sides of an iron pipe, and the bauxite helped protect the iron pipe and the fire brick so that 
they would have to replace those iron pipes about every six months, but they were able to collect uh, aluminum chloride in very large scales. I believe that at one time they had one aluminum chloride uh, production uh, facility that was making 40,000 pounds a day of aluminum chloride. The uh, Gulf Oil Corporation eventually built 27 uh, aluminum chloride stills at the Port Arthur refinery. They built three others at their Fort Worth refinery. All aluminum chloride was made at the Port Arthur refinery, and they would ship aluminum chloride in iron drums by rail from Port Arthur to Fort Worth in order uh, to get the material up there. There were advantages, obviously, to the aluminum chloride process once it was developed, otherwise they would have spent the money. Um, before the aluminum chloride process came along, the early thermal processes, the gasoline that they used smelled pretty foul. <coughs> gasoline smelling today. It had a lot of sulfur in it. It had a lot of unsaturated material. There was a lot of discoloration. And what they found was the aluminum chloride process eliminated the discoloration and the, the foul odor from the gasoline. So they had a product which they considered to be sweet. They also found, once they started utilizing this material, that it had better anti-knock properties than the thermal gasoline of the day. As a matter of fact, the origin of no-nox gasoline, which was a mainstay of Gulf for many, many years, comes from the aluminum chloride process. The aluminum chloride gasoline was the original no-nox gasoline. In developing the aluminum chloride synthesis process, which was really the, the major coup for Gulf, um, they were able to get their price down, their cost of making the material, to three cents a pound from the dollar fifty pound they paid for it originally. They were not the only people who were interested in this though. There were several other companies that patented processes and many other companies who didn't patent processes. But in particular, uh, Alcor Chemical Company, uh, Standard Oil of New Jersey, the individuals who were getting patents in Alcor Chemical Company in 1916, 1917, uh, the company seems to have disappeared, but their names all of a sudden appear as that company disappeared at Standard Oil of New Jersey. I have not been able to find out whether Alcor Chemical Company was a subsidiary of Standard that was reabsorbed or whether it was a separate company that was absorbed by Standard. But um, there are a significant number of patents by Standard in New Jersey, both in aluminum chloride cracking and in um, attempts to make aluminum chloride. So they they really seriously tried to develop this process, although they never commercialized. Texas Company was also active, and Sinclair Refining in 25 was one patent on trying to recycle aluminum chloride. Um, part, one of the reasons why many of these people got into this other processes for making and recycling aluminum chloride was the recognition that aluminum chloride could be used to make lube oils. In the late 20s, uh, Many manufacturers, including Gulf, started making lube oils using aluminum chloride-based processes. As a matter of fact, the origin of Gulf Pride oil was their highest quality oil, which was generated from the aluminum chloride process. Now, just to show the significance of Gulf's attempts to make aluminum chloride, although I imagine the people back probably can see this very well, um, if you look at aluminum chloride production in the United States in thousands of pounds, there were, between 1918 and 1923, Gulf only made a very small amount. But in 1923, when their, their main battery of the aluminum chloride plant came online, they started making huge amounts of aluminum chloride. In 24, there was, in the entire country, only about um, 12 million pounds of aluminum chloride were produced, and almost 11 million were produced by Gulf refining. And I have percentages over there on the right of the total percentage of the total aluminum chloride produced in the country and also of anhydrous aluminum chloride, which was the material that Gulf was using. Um, when you get down into 1927, 28, and 29, when the anhydrous numbers are available for the whole country, what you find is Gulf is producing between 91 and 94 percent of all the anhydrous aluminum chloride produced in the United States. This was significant in that. 
aluminum chloride, as we all know from the laboratory scale, is a very important catalyst material. All the Friedel-Crafts chemistry is, is uh, utilizes aluminum chloride processes, and many of the dye processes involve aluminum chloride. But up until this time, they were not utilized to a very large extent industrially because aluminum chloride was too expensive to use. Well, in 1929, thermal processes, thermal cracking processes had improved to the point where the um, thermal cracking of gasoline was competitive with aluminum chloride price-wise, and Gulf decided to get out of the aluminum chloride cracking business and only use aluminum chloride for the production of lube oils. Now what this did is it left them with a huge capacity for making aluminum chloride, which they didn't need any longer, and they had spent a lot of money. So what they did was um, McAfee, at an AICAT meeting, announced how they had developed a process for making aluminum chloride, and also announced that Gulf Oil Corporation would be selling aluminum chloride at five cents a pound in train car quantities to anybody who was interested in buying. Uh, the price the day before he made that, that talk was about 12 and a half cents a pound. So what this did was open the door for a significant amount of uh, interest in going back and looking at old Friedel Crafts chemistry, a lot of chemistry in the literature, and by other refiners for using aluminum chloride in, in making the In, I'll have to read this too because I imagine so. Um, the, in industrial and chemical uh, engineering news, which was the predecessor of CV News, um, the, an editorial said, referring to McAfee and Gulf and the aluminum chloride process, uh, in many a laboratory, the long list of Friedel and Crafts synthesis worked out and described some 50 years ago will now be reinvestigated from the standpoint of commercial utility since at last aluminum chloride is available in carload units. Those who make a fundamental reagents available to industry at a cost permitting more extensive use to perform services beneficial effects of which will be felt for many a year to come. This, even though today nobody knows who McAfee was or anything about this process, at the time, the making the aluminum chloride available was considered one of the most important events of 1929 in the chemical industry because it meant that a lot of new chemistry, old chemistry, would become new chemistry from the industrial <coughs> Um, this is a part of a panoramic view of the aluminum chloride and um, the refining facility at the Port Arthur plant. And this slide is the part where they were making fluorine and making aluminum chloride. And then over here are the 27 stills for uh, refining the material. In Developing this talk, and indebted to several people, um, Dr. Hugh Akers of the Chemistry Department of Warren University encouraged me to put this little bit of history out in the public forum. Uh, we had many conversations in which we recognized that it's very easy for material, even three generations old, to be completely lost from the historical perspective and from the historical record. Uh, when you have someone like Poudry who comes along and fundamentally changes the entire industry. It's very easy to feel that this person sprang from the brow of Zeus and that nothing came before. And many times, information that came before is lost. And so he was very much responsible for putting this out. Um, Dale Karev uh, took the photographs from the actual articles, the photographs of the plant facilities. I also want to thank the University of Scranton, who funded my trip here, and the John and Mary Gray Library at Lamar University. Um, McAfee, in his later years, became very, very active in civic affairs and eventually uh, became active in the new university that was built in the 1950s in Beaumont, Texas, primarily to help support the local industry to produce chemists and engineers for the petrochemical industry in the region. He was the first uh, chairman of the Board of Regents of the university, and he donated his personal 
journals to the university when he retired in 1951. Um, I had the advantage of actually being able to not only see the papers he wrote, but to see his copy of the papers he wrote, including in the margins his marks for the corrections which subsequently appeared in some of the papers. Um, the library was also very helpful in getting the library loan material since it was difficult to find information about this. And here we have one of the donor cards in the front of one of uh, the Matthews journals at the library at the University of New York University. Um, this is a, a story that I think certainly is of value to be told, uh, not to take away from the significant accomplishments of Eugene Goodry. Uh, there, in many times, we need to remember that there were other people before our major players who contributed significantly. Thank you. on at what point in the development of the process they did it. Um, at the beginning, they just added it to the crew. Uh, at one time, they were actually trying to, to generate aluminum chloride in the crew by putting bauxite into the crew and pumping the chlorine and HCl gas into the crew. Uh, so it depends on at what point um, they were using it. Now, there, there is one patent, I forget which company, where they tried to support it on silica gel, I believe, but I can't remember what company it was, and they never commercialized that process. I take it there must be some mechanism for stripping from the distillate the aluminum chloride that's in the chloride. not good Oh, they, well, they had a series of condensers where in the first condenser, which was um, a condenser for high boiling material, the high boiling petroleum and the aluminum chloride that's sublime to get caught in that condenser and they had scrapers to knock it back down into the, the vessel. Was the aluminum chloride to be in hydrous? Yes. Yes. As a matter of fact, one of the important processes in one of the important features in developing the cracking process was they first had to heat the oil to get all the water out of it before they added the aluminum chloride. Petroleum itself was wet, then they wouldn't get the catalytic properties. Did Tesco ever develop? They developed an isomerization, they, they commercially developed an isomerization facility during the Second World War to make aviation gasoline, but they never did a cracking process. Gulf was the only company that did cracking, with the possible exception of this Hoover company, which I have people in uh, Oklahoma find records that it ever existed, although I have patents and I have this in the National Petroleum News article. And what would going to be the, the applications of hydrogen, which was... Um, uh, Dave T. Day, in 1906, patented hydrogen, catalytic hydrogenation as a process for taking uh, vegetable oil to fat. And then he also patented a process for hydrogenating petroleum. But the catalyst 